China, uh, to Indonesia, this and that. And of course, there were many different interpretation of what is Sufism. And uh, so Sufism, uh, it is of course the European world. Uh, first, it, wa it was used in Latin language because the first treatise composed by European on Sufism was composed in Latin. As you know, Latin in Europe, especially in Western Europe, uh, Latin was the lingua franca. And for long, all the writers, they did not use the vernacular language, they used Latin. For example, in France, the first use of French was not before uh, the 16th century, before uh, people used to write in Latin, okay. So Sufism, it was first used in the Latin and it comes from this uh, Arabic word. Uh, it is written al ta sa -uf. So, and uh, according to all the specialists and especially to the specialists, uh, according to the specialist in Arabic language, still we cannot say exactly the meaning of this word. Of course, there were a different etymology which were proposed. Uh, the two main command, first it would come from an Arabic word, suf, meaning wood, because uh, according to our knowledge, the first Sufi they used to dress with uh, woolen, uh, um, dress, but according to others, but I'm not very convinced, it would come from the Greek uh, Sophia, as you can find it in philosophy. Sophia, the meaning of Sophia in Greek, it is wisdom. So, Suf would come from Sophia. But as I said, and as uh, Saz knows, <laughs> I'm obsessed with sources. And so according to these sources, we cannot find the final answer, but it doesn't matter. Uh, what uh, we have to know is that the first people to be called Sufi, they were living in the Middle East, in Syria today, and they were ascetics. They were people living in the desert uh, alone and doing uh, a number of exercises. And uh, for them, it was the uh, best way to be closer to God, to their God. So it is the first, I would say, uh, appearance of the Sufi in Arabic literature. And uh, later on, but not before the late 11, early 12th century, this Sufi, they started to organize themselves uh, like brotherhood, order, uh, Sufi order, Sufi brotherhood. But it was, uh, of course, a, a kind of long process starting at the end of the 12th century. Um, and then today, for example, because so as I said, you can find uh, Sufi in all the Muslim lands and also uh, even where there are a Muslim population and even in Western Europe, North America, because uh, to some extent uh, Sufism was uh, uh, su uh, successful as a kind of wisdom, even new age wisdom, all these uh, new spiritual movements. But also Sufism was very uh, important because many of the greatest poets in different languages, many languages, they were them said Sufi. And uh, the lady asked me uh, about this book on Rumi. Uh, you can see Rumi here. It's a miniature of Rumi. And of course, even now, as you know, he wrote in Persian because even if he was living in today, Turkey, in Konya, he was born near the border of present Iran and Afghanistan. So his mother tongue was Persian. And um, today is the most famous and important Sufi, uh, especially because his of his poetry uh, known as Masnavi. Um, it's a very huge uh, Sufi poetry. 
and it's a really a fascinating poetry. Of course, it is translated in many, many languages uh, all over the world. And also uh, Rumi was uh, famous for the Sufi uh, brotherhood he created, but it was really organized after his death by his uh, successors, his descendants in the city of Konya, uh, today in Turkey. Yeah, he is also famous for this uh, new Sufi brotherhood he created, named um, the Mevlevi, and usually translated into English as the whirling dervishes. And of course, they are very famous. Here you can see also this uh, uh, representation of this uh, whirling dervishes. So also what is very important in Rumi's poetry um, is the role Rumi gives to dance, to this dance, but it's a very ritualized dance. It's very well organized dance. And uh, I had the chance to see the whirling dervishes. And uh, it, it's, I was very um, impressed and amazed how it is organized. It, there are very precise rules. This whirling dervishes, they have a master. And uh, uh, I mean, there is no improvisation of anything less. And also, um, when I saw the whirling dervishes, Already, I had visited uh, Sewan Sharif in Pakistan, uh, in Sin, where is the tomb of Lal Shabazz Kalandar, because in uh, Sewan Sharif, you can find also dervish, but the, locally they are called fakir, and they are also doing a kind of uh, dance we can compare to some extent to this dance, but I shall come back to it uh, later on. Yeah, so Rumi is the uh, most famous Sufi poet and a spiritual uh, writer in Sufism. And as I said, so he was himself uh, composing his poetry in Persian. Uh, yeah, and also just a few words on this other miniatures. Um, so he, he, it is a kind of illustration of the first phase of the Sufi when they were ascetics. And according to the different legends, tradition, uh, as for ex example, one very famous uh, named Taskira Aulia, composed by Fariduddin Attar, also in Persian. Uh, this first Sufi, as, as ascetics, they were also living in the nature. And as you can see, uh, very close to the uh, animals. And it's a very common trap in Sufism that these ascetics, they were, they were living friendly with the wild animals. They were talking. Uh, with them, um, etc. So uh, now we are coming to the Indus Valley. Yeah, something is missing here. <laughs> Never mind. And uh, so, as you know, the Muslim, the Arabs, they came uh, before Islam because for a commercial relationship within. Uh, between the uh, Middle East and, uh, uh, and India. But after Islam, after the uh, early seventh century, so after one century, the Mus a Muslim army came to South Asia, uh, of course, to Sindh. Uh, it was the army um, led by uh, Mohammed bin Qasim, who was in the army of the Umayyad uh, Caliph from uh, Damascus. So probably, uh, that very soon some Sufi came to the Indus Valley. Uh, in Sin, even today, we can find some tombs of uh, persons who were probably Sufi. I'm sorry, I use always wood, wood. It's always because of, of lack of sources. But in this respect, uh, for those who are interested, uh, the best book regarding the early centuries of Islam, 
Uh, it is the one by Daryl MacLean, a religion and society of Arab sin, because he's almost the only one who really work on original sources in Arabic, in Persian especially. So for this uh, period, I would say of the 8th century, 9th century uh, is the best source. And uh, according to a number of um, inputs, I would say, we can deduce that uh, even in this early period of Islam in the Indus Valley, there were Sufi. And even now, as I see in Sin, you can find some terms. For example, in Delta Xin, there is the term of uh, Haji Turabi, one Haji Turabi. Uh, it is not far from Milpur Sacro. And apparently, it would have been a Sufi. OK. <coughs> but in the Indus Valley, uh, I would say that a very important Sufi came. Uh, his name was. Ali al Hujviri, but is better known today in Pakistan as Dataganj Bakhsh. And his tomb is located in Lahore, in Punjab proper, so to say. And it's a very important pilgrimage center. And of course, already many years back, there was a terrorist attack in this uh, Dataganj Bakhsh uh, mausoleum. But it's very famous. I would say is almost one of the first name we know through historical sources of the Sufi who came to settle to the Indus Valley. And uh, he's also very famous because he authored a treatise, a treaty, a Sufi treatise uh, named Kashf al Ma'ajub, the unveiling of the hidden world. And it is the uh, oldest treatise on Sufism written in Persian, we know. So it's very interesting that the first uh, treatise written in Persian was not written in uh, Persia of Iran, but in the Indus Valley. You can find it there, are, of course, English translation. Um, I would say uh, it's a very um, comprehensive treatise about what is Sufism in the 11th century. He developed different uh, uh, spiritual ways, uh, different techniques, different, he also gives the description of the different Sufi brotherhood known as Tarika, the different Sufi Tarika. So it's a very uh, useful uh, um, book, I would say, but it is not at all related to poetry. And what is very interesting, he uh, put a chapter on music because it was a very important uh, debate among the Muslim to know if music and dance are lawful or not. And so according to Hujviri in his treatise, we can find that um, he made a kind of distinction in music in dance. So he said that uh, sometimes the Sufi, uh, they are doing uh, uncontrolled dance and for him, it is unlawful. But if the people are doing uh, a kind of dance as the wording Dovish will do later on, so it is allowed. So it is a kind of balanced opinion. He, he didn't say it's forbidden to play music or to dance. I, I, I make a distinction between these two kind of them. But uh, so his uh, treatise is of course very interesting. And it, it's also, I would say the first testimony of Sufism. It's a very big uh, treatise. There are many issues uh, al Hujwiri is addressing in this. And uh, you know, in relation, uh, when I say that in the 11th, 12th century, it was the, uh, beginning when the Sufis started to form brotherhood. So al Hujriri is, uh, in fact, we don't know if he was affiliated to a Sufi brotherhood because in his famous treatise, he didn't uh, refer to any brotherhood. Also, he gave the depiction of the most important brotherhood. 
Sufi Brotherhood in um, all over the Muslim world, of course. So now I turn to uh, Sin especially. And as I said, uh, probably that Sufism penetrated into Sin very early after the coming of Islam and the Muslim. Uh, but still, there is a lack of sources about that period. So now I want to uh, focus on two Sufi figures uh, in Sind, and uh, it's very interesting because these two Sufi figures, uh, I would say they represent the two main trends in Sufism, in Sind and beyond. And also uh, the terms of these two figures are the most important uh, Sufi center, uh, pilgrimage center. And I, so I start by the uh, more recent, of course, he's very famous, is uh, Shabdul Latif, uh, who passed away in 1752. Um, so this uh, representation is not very old. We don't have old uh, uh, poster of Sufi uh, in uh, Sindh and in Pakistan also. Uh, but it's really impossible to know when it was made constructed, but what I can say, it is that this comes from a poster uh, I bought many years back, maybe 20 years back, and today you cannot find this one. There is other official uh, representation of Shah Abdul Latif. Uh, so it's very interesting because you can see behind him, uh, there is a tree, there is an instrument so it means that uh, music was very important for him, and still it is, because even today in his uh, darbar, uh, every night there are the fakir who are playing and singing his poetry. Um, and uh, Shabdul Latif uh, so was living in a very troubled period, because as you can see, he passed away in 1752. And after the death of the Mughal emperor Aurangzeb in early 18th century, it was the start of the decline of the Mughal empire and especially different invasion from the West. First Nadir Shah from Persia and then after Ahmad Shah Durrani from Afghanistan, they came to the Indus Valley and up to Delhi because uh, it was, of course, still the most important capital of the Mughal. And so they devastated. Sorry. Sorry. What? I... Somebody was speaking by mistake. Please carry on. OK. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, Shabdul Latif was living is this very, uh, I would say, dangerous uh, period because you know this Nadir Shah, this Ahmed Shah Durrani, uh, their army were destroying all and everything, and especially uh, all along this uh, Indus Valley. So his poetry is very uh, famous, and uh, it is in Sindhi, and for all the Sindhi, is the greatest. Uh, uh, poet and, and his poetry is the pinnacle of uh, literature in Sindhi uh, even now. And uh, also, interestingly, it is unknown uh, to which Sufi Brotherhood Shabdul Latif was affiliated, if any. And another question, also we don't know if uh, Shabdul Latif was Sunni Muslim or Shia, but what we can say, it is that today, the older of his Darbar and the Fakir, they are Shia. Okay, so uh, Shabdul Latif poetry uh, was uh, orally transmitted uh, during centuries. And uh, it is said that himself, he, he didn't want it to be written. And uh, it is only in the 19th century that a German missionary uh, printed the Shah 
Joe Risalo, so the Sufi poetry composed by Shah Abdul Latif. Yeah, it's a very uh, amazing, so to say, because this Trump, he was a German, but he was an Anglican priest. And uh, he went to sin as a missionary. Um, so he was close to the commissioner in sin, uh, Sir Bartle Frere, and it was when the British had decided to withdraw Persian as the official language and to adapt the vernacular language. So here, Cindy. And um, this Sir Bartol Frere, he wanted the British officer to be instructed into Cindy for dealing with the everyday affairs and issue with the local population. So they need to have printed books and so Bartol Frere, uh, after Richard Burton, uh, think that this book was very important. And so he asked Ernst Trump, who was a, a philologist, uh, no, <laughs> la, yes, <laughs> and uh, to print it. So as you can see, it was printed in 1866. It's not the first book in Cindy, but it was printed in Leipzig, Germany. It was printed is this kind of Arabic script, but the one, an Arabic script uh, composed by uh, uh, Trump himself and adapted to Sindhi language. Because in Arabic script, I think there are initially 25 or 26 letters. And in Sindhi, there are 52. So he had new letters with this uh, Arabic script for giving the Sindhi sounds. Uh, and it was his first publication after, of course, there were many uh, other. So still, uh, Shabdul Latif's uh, Darga is very important in the Sindhi life. Uh, and as you can see, it is a main entrance of the uh, Tom itself, uh, many uh, people used to come and especially, of course, for the annual fair, uh, the Urs. And also just a few words of uh, Abdul Latif, Shabdul Latif poetry. There are many uh, different uh, issues in his poetry. And of course, it was translated a number of times into English. The last translation uh, was achieved by Christopher Shackle and published by Harvard University Press in 2018. It's a very recent one. I don't know where it is, but it's a very good one. And also because there is a Cindy text on a page and the English translation uh, on the other. So, it's a very powerful poetry. Um, and there are a number of remarkable uh, issues in this poetry. Uh, of course, Shabdul Latif used the Sindhi folk tales as for symbolizing the quest of the human soul the quest for God of the human soul. And especially he takes the woman as this symbol of the human soul looking for God. Um, so you can find in many uh, different chapters of his poetry, uh, heroine like Saswe and Marvi and many others. But another remarkable point is the importance he gives to Jogi, to the Jogi the yogi, and he used many different terms for naming them. Uh, he gives such an importance to the yogi that he said that he traveled uh, uh, with them, that he visited the uh, Hindu pilgrimage places, spiritual places with them, such as Varka and also Hinglaj. And there is especially a chapter named Sur Ramkali, which is very amazing because, you know, uh, every paragraph in this chapter about the Jogi, the importance they had for him, the last verse is, without them, I could not live. It is, uh, 
in all the, the paragraph of this chapter. So this is very interesting, uh, the importance he gives to the jogi. And of course, it shows that during his lifetime, the jogi, and especially we, we can think they were not panti followers of Goraknat, uh, they, they play a very important role in the uh, society uh, of sin. So there are, of course, many other things, and I only recommend you uh, to have a look at the Shajori Salo in Sindhi or in English, because uh, really this uh, translation by Christopher Shackle is very good uh, into English and uh, the, to, to give the Sindhi, the Sindhi text. Uh, yes. So now, okay. yeah. India as well, right? Uh recent uh, a translation in India, Shabnam. Uh, yeah, Mara. yes, yes. Yeah, but uh, I, of course it's all, I have this book and it's also a very good translation, but um, uh, I would say that the approach is different because in Shabnam uh, world, uh, there is, a, I would say only a selection of chapters and with comments and with, uh, so it's a different kind of work, I would say. I was quoting uh, Christopher Shackle uh, because it is a more recent, I think. Uh, Shabnan was before, no? If no, no I Shabnan, I think, is now a few months ago. Oh, no, you're right. Yeah, 20, 2019, I think. Yeah, you're right. I saw myself. This is the one, the title. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yes, so I was uh, quoting uh, Christopher Shackle's one because he, first there is the Cindy text <laughs> in Cindy, and also because uh, he translated the whole Shajuri Salo. And uh, so uh, I think that in uh, Chabnan, Chabnan's work, it's only a uh, selection, if I remember properly. Okay. <laughs> okay. So now I turn to the other figure, uh, important Sufi figure in Sindh. So it is this uh, Lal Shabbat calendar. Uh, alors, so I, I say that uh, I am to speak about two Sufi figures because they really represent the two main branches of Sufism in Sindh. So first you had uh, Shabdo Latif, uh, I would say that his poetry is very important. It's a very kind of classical Sufi poetry in Sindhi. Uh, with uh, Lal Shabbat's calendar, it is a very different context. Uh, first, Lal Shabbat's calendar is said to have reached uh, Sindh, the Indus Valley, in late 13th century, uh, because he would have died in 1274 and settled in Sewan Sharif, uh, which was uh, on the bank of the Indus River. Uh, the tradition over there is very different if you compare it with Shabdo Latif. Uh, so it is said that he came from Persia, but you know, the 13th century, many Sufi came from Persia to India, not only to the Indus Valley, even of course, you know, Muhyiddin Chishti in Ajmer, uh, you know also in Delhi, Nizamuddin and others. Uh, because probably, you know, there was a very big event in the Middle East and in Persia especially in early 13th century. It is the Mongol, not Mughal, Mongol Genghis Khan, invasion from the north. And so many Sufi, because the Mongol also, they used to destroy all and everything and to kill everyone and to say to make pyramids of heads, etc. So many Sufi uh, uh, went to India to as kind of first of refugee, this and that. So probably that this Lal Shabbat calendar uh, reached Sindh and Siwan Sharif in these circumstances, as many other Sufi in today Pakistan and uh, India. But uh, there is something different also with Shabdo Latif that we can find is in, in his name. His name, it is in fact his, 
nickname because his original name is Usman Marvandi. Marvandi means that it would have come from a city into the Iran, in Western Iran, near Turkey, named Marvand or Marand, and still there is this city. But he was nicknamed uh, Lal Shabazz Kalandar. So Lal, of course, it means red, but it is a sp spiritual concept in Persian Sufism. It is a kind of symbol of divine knowledge. Uh, Shabazz, it is the falcon in different languages, and Kalandar. And Kalandar, it refers to a Sufi group, um, but they were very special group in South Asia especially, because there were very critics toward the other Sufi, toward the other Sufi uh, brotherhood, and especially when the different Sufi brotherhood, the one would settle in Multan, in Lahore, in Delhi, in Hajmer, because all these Sufi, they became to look for the political power, uh, so they became very rich themselves. And according to so other Sufi, they forget the original tradition of Sufism linked to asceticism. So this calendar, they were a kind of antinomian Sufi. They were against the rule, especially against the political power, but also they were they used to challenge the Sharia, the Islamic law, to do the opposite of what the Sharia was asking to do. And there were, and we have historical uh, references from the 14th, 15th centuries in Persian, of course, but <coughs> we have um, different authors who spoke about this calendar, that they were very dangerous. And sometimes there were even um, kind of fights between the calendar and other Sufi, belonging to other Sufi Tariqa brotherhood. This Lal Shabazz calendar, we have two historical references to him from the 14th centuries. Okay, the first it is Ibn Battuta. He was a Moroccan traveler who came to India, spent some years in India, and he spent some days in Sewan. And the other one, it is Barani. Barani, he was the official historiographer of the Turluk Sultan of Delhi. But this uh, last is important because he mentioned Lal Shabazz under the name of Usman Marvandi in Multan. And he said that this Usman Marvandi in Multan, he was invited by the governor of Sindh and he performed a dance, a kind of whirling dance. So we have this information from a 14th century uh, author. It's very interesting because as you know, today uh, this pilgrimage place where there is a tomb of Lal Shabazz Kalanda is very famous for this uh, ecstatic dance known as Damal. But uh, once again, we don't have very old sources. If you want to study the origin of this uh, dance and also uh, all about Lal Shabazz, because as you can see, the first uh, uh, source we can find, uh, once again, there is this map made by a British officer uh, uh, of Sewan Sharif, and the uh, uh, Darba of Lal Shabazz is located here. And it's only in 1905 that you can find a first book uh, really devoted to Lal Shabazz Kalanda. It is written by a local uh, intellectual, Fateh Mohamed Sevani, uh, and it is uh, named Kalanda Nama, Namo Sindhi. So it is, and this uh, intellectual, he was from Sevan, as we can see his name. He collected oral traditions all around him, but so it's very interesting and important. 
and he put them uh, into his book. But what we can ask it, we don't really know why did he publish his book? Probably it was asked by the Sufi master of the place because this place already in early 20th century and even today, it was mostly um, under the control of two Sayyid families. So as you know, the Sayyid in the Muslim society, they are uh, located at the apex of the society because they claim to be the descendant of Prophet Muhammad. So in Sewan, there were, and still there are, two main Sayyid family. They share the uh, management, so to say, of the Darbar, the organization of the ritual especially. But there is something very important to mention about Sewan Sharif. Of course, as in most of the uh, uh, pilgrimage places and Sufi pilgrimages especially, you know, there is the annual fair, the Melo, the Mela, also known as Urs in Sufi context. And during these three days, uh, the people they celebrate the death of the Sufi, but the death of the Sufi is interpreted as being the merging of the Sufi with God. And during the three days, there are procession to bring Hena to the tomb because the Sufi is also said to get married with God. And in a Sufi representation, he is himself the, uh, the girl, the woman. And uh, so for three days, every day, a family is taking the henna from the, uh, its place. And in a procession, they are taking the henna to the tomb uh, of Lal Shabbat Kalanda. And so what is very uh, important, it is that since many centuries, according to local population, and even now, so the first day, the henna procession is taken by the uh, main Sayyid family. They are named the Lakhiari. The second day, the henna procession is taken by a Hindu family. And the third day, it is taken by another Hindu family. And so this organization is still at work during the Mela uh, of Lal Shabbat Kalanda. So when you ask uh, why there are two uh, Hindu family which are involved into the procession, uh, usually people say that it was the will of Lal Shabbat himself because he, he had been very welcomed by some uh, Hindu followers because he was not only um, giving his own uh, spiritual message to the Muslim, uh, he also considered that the Hindu were among his followers. And so uh, still uh, it is uh, the uh, local uh, situation. So uh, maybe that I stop now. Um, ladies, would you like, uh, uh, do you want to have an interaction? Or would you like Michelle to continue? Can you just raise your hand? Or, uh, you can unmute yourself if you want to speak. Rita? Rita, can you unmute yourself? Yes. Thanks. Yeah, there's so much that Michael, Mich how, how do I pronounce his name? Michelle? Yeah. Michelle. <laughs> Michelle, okay. Uh, we are uh, learning so much. I don't, uh, I need to know more to be able to ask you questions, but if you could continue, it would be lovely. Oh, okay, but uh, I can continue for hours and days. And we can <laughs> listen. You'll have an audience. <laughs> So, oh. Michelle, do you have, how much time do you have? <laughs> Not that much. So, another 10 minutes then? Okay, okay. Great, okay. whatever. Very okay, good. so I, I go ahead. Um, 
yeah okay so uh, i just want to uh, also say a few words about how did the british uh, take interest or not into sufism and it's very uh, interesting for example to see this painting uh, dated uh, 1846 so it is only three years after the british conquest of sindh and uh, I found it uh, very uh, fabulous. Why? Uh, not for the aesthetic quality of the painting, be but because, you know, I spent many months in Sewan Sharif. And when the first time I saw this painting, it was very difficult for me to understand what was the painter presenting what was the part of Sewan. And uh, so it took me uh, some time to understand, but now I did understand. But it's a very um, amazing representation of Sewan Shari. And, and also- uh, I'm first... Sorry to interrupt, there's a question come up. So okay. would you like to take questions now or after? No, we can, we can take. Uh, we so can take uh, the question is, uh, Bharti, would you like to say it? You can unmute yourself and ask. Okay, thanks, Saz. Uh, I would like to know um, what would be the status of women in Sufism? Yeah, <laughs> very interesting and important questions. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, let me brief. I would say that generally the status of women among the Sufi is not different uh, than in the local society. And of course, this is a very patriarchal society. So it means that most of the Sufi, they are men. And despite this symbolism I talked about uh, related to the female, the virahini, you know, the uh, longing soul. Um, so it doesn't mean that uh, women cannot be a Sufi because some are. So it means that there is no um, explicit uh, how to say, impossibility for the woman to be Sufi. And for example, I spent much time in Sevan, there are women, but who are Sufi and even who are uh, Sufi master, but there are peripheral in the context of the local <coughs> social system. So the other Sufi, because in Sewan it's a very complex system. There are many Sufi masters in competition, this and that, but they also acknowledge themselves. And to some extent, they have made a kind of distribution of the ritual roles in uh, Sewan in the Darba. So they, they don't uh, go against women who claim to be Sufi and even when they want to have followers, but they stay on the periphery of the system. They are not involved in the ritual system. They are not involved in performing this dance. Uh, I mean, officially. So it is why I say that, uh, you know, still the local society is very patriarchal. And so there are no different. But in this respect, if I may, there is a very good book by Shimam, Shimim Abbas Burney. And the title is something like The Female Voice in Sufi Rituals. And it is devoted to Sufism in the Indus Valley. But today it is an et ethnographical study. But so she deals with a uh, Sufi uh, woman, uh, and especially in Sewan Sharif, because, uh, for example, according to her, there are different uh, female Sufi singers who 
spread this famous song, Dama Damas Kalanda. That's right, yes. Thank you, thank you, Michelle. Please. Okay, so just a few words about this painting. It's so important to see uh, how people represent things. Yeah, so I was, uh, as I said, a little bit lost the first time I saw this painting because, you know, uh, even during this 19th century and even now in Sewan, the most important place is Lal Shabazz Kalandaz Darga, Darbar. It is the art of the town, the core. And here you see the Darba is here. It is a very small part of the wall painting. Uh, and it is also represented in a very particular manner because you can see only the wall, this big wall, but from here, you can't see it's a Darba, you can't see it's a Darga. And also there is another very interesting, but also intriguing uh, point in the painting. It is the characters. As you can see, mostly they are soldiers. And if you look at it properly, you can see most of them almost all of them, they are looking at one character, this character. And this character, so it is probably, it is maybe a calendar, it is maybe a jogi, of course, we can say, but it's very amazing that all these characters are looking at him. And, uh, uh, oh, okay, so, so it was very uh, amazing to see how this British uh, represent uh, uh, Sufi related building. And so in fact, they were not interested at all by them. And so now it is a general view of Sewan, but it was uh, uh, more than 10 years back. Uh, here you can see very badly, I know the Indus River still, and you can see also there are different the cupola here, here. And this is the big one, but it is the old one because uh, the, the Darba, the uh, mausoleum of Lal Shabazz Kalanda has been rebuilt many times, even since the time I used to go there. I think the first time I, I came, it was in 2000, so 20 years back. And I think that it has been rebuilt maybe three times since yet. So now the cupola is different. Still it is golden with golden leaf, but uh, the, the shape uh, is uh, different. Okay. <laughs> so I don't know, uh, are there other questions? Um, yes, uh, can I? I'm not quite sure when, when did the schism happen between Shias and Sunnis and what role did um, Sufism play in, in this entire, I don't know, this, this Islamic drama, so to speak, when the yeah. schism happened yeah. and no, where, where, what position did Sufi, Sufism yeah. okay. have? Okay, but the, the, the um, uh, schism between Sunni and Shia happens happened, sorry, very early before the Sufi. Because uh, as you know, the uh, separation between the Shia and the Sunni, it came, it started even after the death of Prophet Muhammad. So he died in 632. So in early seventh century. And already when he passed away, there was a disagreement between the Muslim about who was not to succeed the prophet because he was prophet, but for the leadership of the Muslim community. According to some, it would be a companion of the prophet. Uh, about, according to other, it would be the relatives of the prophet. So the first they became Sunni, and the second Shia. So it came very early. 
before uh, anything about Shism. But it is said that later on, there was a, how to say, interaction between Shism and Sufism. Uh, still, it is very difficult to study this uh, because the issue of sources, of course. But what we can do, it is that in most of the Sufi brotherhood, in most, the spiritual chain go back to Ali, who is also the first Imam for the Shia. So, and also there are many other issues, and especially in several sh Sharif, when we can see there was really uh, many exchanges between Shiism and Sufism, uh, circulation of many symbols, even rituals, etc. So does this mean that uh, uh, Sufism started with Islam? It is not independent of Islam. No, no. It came from, so maybe that after some Sufi uh, master could have claimed to have been beyond Islam or I don't know what, but historically it comes from Islam. And also, for example, let me say another few words about Shah Abdul Latif, the Sindhi uh, Sufi poet, because in his poetry, the Shah Jodi Salo, I underline the role he gave to the jogi. But if I want to be honest, I have also to underline how many Quranic quotations in Arabic there are in his poetry, many, many. And so he always claimed to be Muslim and he was. And uh, it is said that Shabdo Latif, he was traveling always with three books, the Quran, Rumi's poetry, and his own great grandfather poetry in Sindhi, Shabdul Karim. So after you do, know, you can give many different interpretations but historically, it is well attested that what we call Sufism was born into uh, the Muslim community. So to be a Sufi, but to be a Sufi, you don't have to be a Muslim. Exactly, because the main conception of the majority of Sufi, because there is a big diversity, uh, it is known as uh, Vadat el Wujud, unity of existence. And so for them, you have the practical religion, uh, religion sorry, uh, you can perform uh, the ritual of the religion where you were born, but the Sufi goal and purpose is beyond formal belonging. It is something else beyond. So it is why uh, it doesn't matter if you are Christian, Hindu, Muslim, Buddhist, uh, for you to be a Sufi. And even now, for example, in Sewan Sharif, there are Hindu Sufi master. I myself uh, saw there is one Hindu Sufi master. He was himself initiating Muslim to the spirituality of Sufism. But uh, what I am talking about, it is not shared by all the Sufi. I would say in South Asia, it was the majority. Uh, but as you know, there is a spread of a kind of a process I shall call Islamization in Pakistan and in other country. And uh, even since the time I started to study Sufism in Sin, for example, I could see changes. Uh, what I call Islamization, it is when you mainly focus on what you consider as being the only source for religion. It means the Quran. And so, According to Islamization, 
of course, I, it is very briefly put, but uh, finally for the people, uh, it means that all what is not explicitly put in the Quran is not Muslim. So of course, even now in Pakistan, uh, at the state level, I, I saw a change for, I, I, I could uh, provide many different uh, examples of this. Uh, Michelle, there's a question. Are you a Sufi? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I'm Michelle? sorry. Some of are you, you are disappointed. <laughs> you are. You are so. You are like a Sufi, though. Manaputra. No, I I love Sufi literature. But I'm not, no, because, you know, even your question, thank you, Saz, it's very interesting because it, I turn back to what does it mean to be Sufi? There are for me different level of being a Sufi. So if you consider that someone who loves Sufi poetry is, is a Sufi, okay. But so I think there are many different, many, many Sufi, but in the strict sense meaning of the word, a Sufi, it should have been initiated to a given Sufi path. You should have a master and during the initiation, the master will give you the sacred word for you to meditate. You have to perform certain rituals and the relationship as you know, between the master, the peer, and the follower, the murid, known as Piri Muridi, is very important. So in this respect, I'm not. Uh, so the question was actually from Rita. I wouldn't have asked it because I always thought that you are a Sufi from the way you speak and the way you behave. So I think that's a different, you know, I honestly did think that you, you're, you are a Sufi. Okay, no problem. Uh, so uh, thanks for clarifying. I do have another question, which is that, um, you know, I want to ask you about is reincarnation a concept that is considered in Sufism? Okay, I, I, I just want to, I just want to say why I'm asking is because I've often heard Muslims in India and Pakistan referring to reincarnation you know, in my next life or in your next life. It's something which is a part of the fabric of our society. So I want to know whether that's just coming from the environment or whether it's part of the uh, structure of the belief system. Yeah, so uh, once again, and I'm sorry to repeat, but it's very complex to answer uh, because um, I, I would say that the Muslims, they are bounded by their uh, sacred literature. First, the Quran. So, in the Quran, uh, it is there is nothing about reincarnation. It's a different kind of uh, process after death, etc. But if you have a look at some Sufi poetry, you can find ideas which can be understood as being close to reincarnation, but it is never explicitly put because it is forbidden. And for example, in Rumi poetry, you can find it. You can find that the soul is going through different stages from minerals to animals to human. And of course, the last one is the divine. And also about the divine. It is the same uh, situation, of course, for formal, for uh, normative Islam, it is the biggest blasphemy to claim a man can be God because in the Quran, there is a total distinction between man and God. Uh, but, you know, we can say, if you have a look at Sufi poetry, I'm talking about all the different lands, Arabic, Persian, Turkey, South Asia. The final goal of Sufism is what they call 
uh, fanafila, the absorption in God. So it is very close to the idea that finally the man become God, but it should never be expressed as such because of the Quranic boundaries. Wonderful. That's great. That's such a brilliant explanation. Thank you so much. Is there anyone else with questions? If you have a question, please unmute yourself and ask. Anything else? Uh, Sunita, you wanted you wanted to ask something? Michelle? Yes. I I really don't want to ask anything. I just want to thank you profusely. It has been amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this wonderful talk. You know talk. you're most welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I also felt that I learned so much and it was so yeah. Good. And you, you know, having you sparing your time for us, sharing what you know, it meant so much. Really, it really has. My Thank pleasure. you. Very grateful. Thank you. Hope to see you soon. Yes. In France or maybe in Sint somewhere. Maybe in Pune. Okay. Misha, you're welcome <laughs> okay. here. You know that. No, yeah, to India. Yes, to come to India. I know. To India. I know. I I know. know. He's very happy to come. So you should come here. <laughs> You'll have to come back to Pune. We have some Sufi dargas around here also, no, Sas? We have lots of dargas. Yeah, around, around yeah, around I, I, I meant to send you this link I received. I, I saw to uh, um, a, a paper on uh, on mental health, uh, the the the, uh, the role that dargas play in uh, mental health. So I'm going to send you that. It's a little sad, but it was very interesting. That but the, the, the Dariga of Kamar Ali Darwish, Kamar Ali, that he was a Sufi, Kamar Ali. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Darwish is Sufi, right? So that is just near us, just outside town. Yeah. Shivapur. Shivapur, yeah. And, and what about Baba Jan? Would she have been a Sufi? She came from, she came from Afghanistan. Baba Jan here in the middle of town. You'll have to tell us, Michelle. Do you know ba uh, Baba Jan? No, because as you know, there are so many. Yeah, so are. We'll, we'll send him the link to that also. Yeah, please. She yeah. came all the way from, from Afghanistan to okay. Pakistan to India. She went to Saudi Arabia and mm. then finally came back here in okay. Tupuna. And there is a big darga there. And she had one of the followers that uh, a lot of uh, Parsis also believe in. His name is uh, Meher Baba. And oh, yeah. uh, so, yeah, yeah, Mer Baba, I know. Very interesting to know about her also. Very interesting. We are done, I think. Log on. What happened? Okay. Thank you, Michelle. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Thank you. Thank you so Thank you. much. Thanks okay. a lot. Thank you, Sars. Take care. Take Thank, care. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Sars, also for organizing. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Bye bye. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you.